I'm so excited to introduce Sarah Ziff as our moderator. She's the founder of the Model Alliance, and she's going to be joined on stage by Iskra Lawrence, activist and plus-size model. Lauren Chen, who's a former plus-size model and journalist, formerly of Glamour, and Gary Dakin, who is one of the co-founders of JAG Models. So please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Hi, everyone. Hi. Thanks so much Hi. for having us. Um, so I just wanted to dive right into an issue that we've all been talking about, uh, the sample size. And I wanted to start us off by sharing a quote that I read uh, around Fashion Week uh, from Tom Ford. This appeared in WWD. There is a practical reason that most models are the same size, and that is called a sample collection. You make a sample collection according to a standard selection of measurements for models. One reason people show one size on a runway. I can't eight hours before the show when I'm in a fitting and I decide to use a certain girl, custom make an outfit for her. My clothes are made. They're made in the same size. This is an industry thing. Whether we all decide to start making all of our clothes in the next size up, that's a different thing. But there's a practicality. There's a reason models are a standard size. They've always been a standard size. And then he goes on to say that if they don't fit the clothes, they don't get the job. Uh, reactions. I got like mad hearing you say that, even though I read it 100 times and got mad every of those 100 times. Um, but I guess my answer to people who think like that, though I love Tom Ford and his work, is like, look at Christian and Becca who were just up here. What do you mean? What do they do? And for me and my work, something that I'm so sick of and something that I work really, really hard to obliterate is the idea that our bodies are wrong and the clothes are right. And in fact, it, it, it's, it's, it's so obvious that it's the opposite. Yeah, I mean, that was me. I started modeling at 13 in the UK and I literally did a fashion show where I was backstage, like butt naked, and um, I had the garments to try on and the stylist was there and everyone, um, all the other models were there. And like one after one, I could not fit into anything. And I, was, I literally wanted to just be sucked into the ground. And I saw the stylist cause kind of watching me out the corner of his eye and he goes, what's wrong? And I said, well, I can't fit into anything. And he goes, well, you're too fat then. And I was like okay, I'm literally 14, 15, half naked. All the other models are getting into their looks. They look fantastic and I'm just there. And when I say I'm too big, I was a UK eight to 10, which is a US four to six. Yes, it was absolutely humiliating. I ended up only being able to wear two coats and I just wore coats on the runway instead of the gowns and the beautiful outfits and that was essentially what triggered me to have disordered eating and body dysmorphia for maybe five or six years of my life. How you can say that anyone is standard, how you can say that everyone doesn't deserve to feel good and when they wake up every morning, decide what they're going to wear because it empowers them, like you're missing the whole concept of fashion. Right, and all because a piece of fabric was just made that it's way. It's too much hassle. Yeah. Well, I, I'm a huge fan of Tom Ford as well, but the concept that you're thinking about this just eight hours before your show? Like, how small-minded? Like, you know, Christian and so many other people this season, you know, were thinking when they started their process and wanted to be inclusive and the fact that, again, huge fan, but dude, a <laughs> little bit earlier. Our message to Tom Ford is dude. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's so funny, representing girls from size zero to size 20, like, this is something that I was, my partner and I were very conscious of doing in our agency. And from day one, like, why aren't you thinking, we, when we saw the opportunity, we said, wow, there's such a huge space out there for growth economically. And these other agencies, don't do it, by the way, um, that aren't doing it. And it's like, again, why are you all missing this opportunity financially? This yeah. is insane for retailers and designers to, sit, to ignore 60% of the, comp the population. Well, so I noticed a disconnect too, and I want to ask Iskra, 
you know, you have four million, I was stalking you a little on Instagram, sorry. Um, you have four million followers on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And so that's just by comparison, 500,000 more followers than the luxury brand YSL. Uh, 800,000 more than Harper's Bazaar. Uh, it's almost one million more followers than Vogue Runway. So I'm curious to know how social media has helped your career. Um, and I'm also curious to know how significant having a massive social media following like you do has in booking high-end fashion modeling jobs. Yeah, so that's a very interesting question, and it's one I'm still trying to figure out myself. Um, I have been so empowered by my own followers to believe that there was a different way to go about this. So just as Lauren said, I realized I didn't have to change to fit the garments. I would change the industry. And for me, obviously, as my following grew, I, I ended up having more of a power to be able to do that. Um, and so it began as me sharing the story, as me feeling frustrated, um, because I not only, like I said, told you my story about not fitting into the straight size industry, I then went to visit plus size agencies who said I was too small, um, to which I was devastated, having spent five or six years of my life every single day battling my body to try and fit into that section, to then be told I didn't fit into the other one, um, at which point I just was kind of like, F this, I'm going to do my own thing and prove that beauty is not one size, it's not one shape, it's not one look, it's not one color, it's none of that, it's about how you feel. And as a model, I absolutely love what I do because um, I find aspiration in how I feel on set. Um, I believe the aspiration should not be a look, it should be a feeling, if that's confidence, if that's empowerment, even if it's sexiness, whatever it might be. So I started sharing unretouched photos and talking about my relationship with my body and showing that even as a model or someone in the media, we all have the same feelings of not feeling good enough, not feeling like we fit in. And it resonated. And it was such an empowering moment because that's when I realized I was doing this for them. I wasn't going to change the industry. And these people supported me and they all felt the same way. It's millions of people feel the same way, and I don't understand how we're still at this point. Lauren, you've worked successfully both as a fashion editor and as a model, and last year when you made a guest appearance on the runway for Chromat, yeah. wearing, I think it was in one of the slides we saw earlier, a crimson bathing suit, many women, myself included, applauded you, um, but you also received a lot of nasty comments. And I'm curious to know what you think inspires this hateful shaming of women's bodies that don't conform to the sort of typical runway model uh, mold. And, and what is so provocative about a woman flaunting her curves on the runway? Um, I mean, so first, so much respect to Iskra who deals with um, crazy people on the internet and on Instagram all the time. <laughs> Because it is, that was the, the first and only time that's ever happened to me. Um, and I guess my reaction, it's still hard to put into words. That week, I, I felt crazy. I felt, like a, I felt so out of my body. I felt like attacked in a very odd way. And I mean, we could go on. But basically, what I kind of came away with it, from it with, was that it, I was just shocked. Because my whole body of work from being a plus size model, to being a fashion editor at Glamour, to having a column there about size, to designing clothes, like everything that I do is to push my message of inclusion and size diversity. Um, and n not once over six years have I ever gotten an awful message. But the second that I had the audacity to put my fat ass in a bathing suit on the <laughs> runway, people were like, like livid, and it was mostly men, and it was mostly white men. Um, unpack that, what is that about? I can't, there's too much going on in this country to unpack that, yeah. but I'm Canadian, I was the whole thing. But um, it just, it goes to show me, and, and you know, it, it just goes to show me how much people don't want to see 
women celebrated outside of the standard beauty norm. And that's what we're all up here to try to break through. Yeah, you know what I genuinely think it is? I think for so long the patriarchy has succeeded from women being held back by their insecurities. Yeah. They are terrified that we can be let loose and be these empowered women that can do whatever the hell we want. Yeah. That's, that's what it is. Well, and you've told me that a lot of the people who leave you nasty comments, if you do click a few times on the profiles, they're like middle-aged men and women with little girls, like at home, posted all over the page. Like, mm -hmm. you know, not to judge, but what? What are we teaching people? Yeah, it, it's pretty awful, and this, this discrimination um, and assumption of someone's health and their lifestyle, or even if they're motivated, or so many other things that are solely dictated on their size, um, really frustrates me, and I think it really holds people back, because you are then saying that that person is unworthy of self-love, um, unworthy of um, the same opportunities as someone else, and also just uh, validating that they're okay just as they are, or if they want to change and go on a different journey in their life that that's okay too but we need to encourage everyone to be able to love themselves wherever they are in that journey but there's some self-loathing going on from those Absolutely. people that oh, yeah. are commenting it's like you have nothing better to do it also shows like how deeply ingrained it is in everyone's mind who doesn't even care about fashion that the beauty ideal that fashion puts into the world is the right way to be like what do those those people seemingly have nothing to do with fashion and yet I'm on a runway at Milk Studios on Friday afternoon at four o'clock in September, nobody cares. But then you put it on the internet and they're like seething angry. Mm -hmm. And obviously the lack of inclusivity is a massive issue, but in running the Model Alliance, um, yeah, I've collaborated with researchers at Northeastern and Harvard University and we recently published a study. It was the largest study to date on eating disorders in the industry. And um, we found, uh, I don't think this is, this is a little bit like saying water is wet, but um, <laughs> over 80% of the models surveyed, this is models participating in Fashion Week last year, had uh, a body mass index, a BMI, classified as underweight. Of them, 62% had been asked to lose weight by their agencies. So this is people who are already underweight being told to lose more weight. Over half of them were told they wouldn't book jobs unless they lost more weight, and 20% were told the agency would stop representing them unless they lost weight. It's so Gary. Our industry is discussing. Yeah. Um, it's your story. Well, hopefully changing. So, yeah. and, and you are representative of that change. So as an agent, you have helped to launch the modeling careers of some of the most successful fuller-figured women. <laughs> right. And. I'm just curious to know, in your opinion, like what makes a great model and how can someone transcend size? Um, so we will never ask somebody what their weight is. We will never ask anything. We have to measure because we just need to know when clients ask, you know, what measurements are. Um, but I would never have anybody lose weight, gain weight. It's like, it, it's just not an option. You are who you are. Um, be your best you. There are clients for you at every size. So. Women change constantly, you know, men change constantly. Um, so we're, we're all about that. Um, I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> the, the <laughs> I have many questions. Well, you know, I didn't prep this one, but I'm curious, hearing those statistics, uh, obviously there are a lot of agents, this is at established agencies, that are telling girls to compromise their health in order to do their job. And I'm curious to know, as someone who's representing models of different sizes, whether you think that agencies should be able to say, we're not going to represent you unless you're a size zero or two. No, I think that's disgusting. I think the fact that somebody would tell somebody, you know, Jacqueline and I, when we started this, we were like, if any girl ever looks sick, either one way or the other, because it goes both ways with binging and as well, um, then, she's got to get help or we won't work with her. Like, I don't want somebody to be not well. Um, our thing is we're caretakers and we're caregivers. We're not just people that get you jobs. Like, we treat our women and our girls like a family. And we want to make sure that everybody's healthy in every single way. And we give them every opportunity and every tool. Um, and I have worked at agencies in the past, and I've seen that happen and that's one of the reasons that we decided to launch our own thing because it is not right 
you know, we should be safeguarding these young women. I personally don't believe somebody under 18 should be on the runway. And I love that Condé Nast just said, nobody under 18 will be in our pages. Like, let these young women and young kids have lives and, and develop who they are and develop who their personalities are. Because we're seeing right now, too, people want more than just a model. They want a backstory. And you don't have a backstory at 14. Like, you <laughs> probably don't even have your period. Like, 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 like let's, let, let, let's let these people develop and become good people and then let's encourage that and, and do more for that. And the agencies that, the big agencies that say that to those girls, again, it's the patriarchy, you know, and matriarchy in some of the situations, um, but they've, no one stops them. There's no, there's no governing body and the CFDA should be a little bit more strong and, but there's really no governing body and now you've been working on legislature and we need that legislation, like it's desperate. Like we really, I personally don't because I, I, we do we do everything above board and we don't work with girls under 18 and we make sure you're, you're fine at every size. You're beautiful at every size and that's, everybody should be like that. But for those that aren't, they should be policed. We've seen straight size models and plus size models. What about the girls in between? I hear a lot from models who say they're either pressured to lose weight or gain weight. And that segment's changing rapidly. You know, um, it's fantastic to see that segment. And that's one of the reasons, again, we started ours because there was girls that were eights and tens and twelves and they didn't know where they fit in. And we saw the consumers, Nordstrom specifically was one of the first ones that started going with girls that were fuller and JCPenney even was like, I don't want a lingerie but girl with ribs. Like it's not healthy, you know, I want a woman. So we're seeing a need for it. So we kind of fit that need and started taking girls just because we thought they were beautiful regardless of their size. And people started asking for it more and more and more. Um, Calvin Klein booked, you know, the last two girls that were fuller were ours and, uh, they're just start, it's starting to come more and more and more. And I think the word plus size, and some of the girls do love it, but they're models. They do the same exact job, and now they're starting to get the same exact pay. So let's not, let's, no labels. That's for soup cans. And so on the flip side of my experience, when I was fashion editing at Glamour, I was casting pages, right? And so we saw a huge shift from the top down, like given advice, although young people and, and innovators think this way anyways, to move away from casting models just from modeling boards and go on Instagram and find who's having a great message and who's cool and who's clicking and um, that is kind of yeah, transcendent of size. So we were booking girls of straight sizes, those in-between sizes, plus sizes, and you know when you have a good styling team who puts the effort in to either pull from straight size brands and plus size brands or pull from straight size brands where the cut will work for the photo. Um, you know, it, I think casting in general is shifting more towards, like you said, personality and that will kind of help that in-between set. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's also because the consumer education is improving with social media being able to Essentially, as a model, you are not just a clothes source anymore. Um, as someone who has a large following, I only wear and work with brands that I truly um, love and would wear regardless. And so my followers know that. My followers know, okay, well, if that fits her, I know that she's a size large in this brand. And, and it's, it's that trust and that authenticity that y if you're just a clothes horse, you can't have that. And there's so much more power and it's such a positive power as well to have the consumer really look up to you and think, wow, well, she loves that brand and that means that to her or she loves it because it fits well or da, da, da. And for me, that's why I have this new lease of life because I know I'm not just a 2D image. That I have this connection with the brand that I work with and also the consumer. And that's a, a beautiful relationship. I think we might want to open this up to a, a couple of questions. Yeah. Do we have time for some questions? I like Great. what you said about positive power. Yeah. Because power yeah. can be yeah, abused, yeah, yeah, as totally. we know. Do we have any questions from the audience? I think that. I see people moving and shaking. I see. Blinding. Mm -hmm. Good 
Unless that was a workout. Okay. <laughs> um, hi. Um, hi. Just a small question. Would you say that, you know, as a model, social media has given you more of a bargaining chip because people are starting to see you as a person, not so much as something to hang clothes on? Exactly, yes. Kind of to follow on from exactly what I was just saying, 100%. They see you as a, uh, more of a human. Sometimes the trolls definitely don't. But the people who are following you and seeing you, also, you see it IRL. So it's not, uh, even when I'm moving about, Insta stories, they can see I'm wearing an outfit. They can kind of see it in situ. They can also see how I'm using fashion in my everyday life, which I believe is um, way more inspiring than just seeing a very highly constructed image. I still love fashion, I love the fantasy, I love editorial, but being able to see, you know, a cute pair of jeans and think, okay, well, she's running around in those, they must fit well, they're stretchy, they're, it really is a great way for the consumer to see how the product looks, like, on, on a real body. I also would add, like, you're, you're more than, you know, it's so, because you have so many followers, people think that she gets these jobs because of, she has so many followers, she's also really good at her job. Like, she's a really great model, she's a beautiful woman, and she connects with everybody that she works with. And it's kind of amazing and fascinating to watch that, yeah. so. I'm excited because um, it's taken being a model to a different place. I can sit in marketing meetings and actually have an impact because I'm speaking to the consumer. I am directly di direct messaging and reading every single comment that I receive, even when there's you know, 5,000, I go through and I read them and I'm listening to what these young girls are saying. Um, um, especially when I work with Airy, I'm their role model because I wasn't just a, a model, like physically in the images. I was in the meetings, I was talking about marketing strategies, I was talking about how we can change the changing room experience. I said, why aren't we doing cute little notes where they can post it up and write an empowering message and leave it for themselves and leave it for someone else? So that it definitely has taken it to a whole new level. Thanks for your question. <laughs> Um, so I go to the high school of fashion industry and every time we're getting ready for a fashion show you see all these girls they get nervous about trying to um, go to the casting shows and everything so how do you feel um, how do you think other girls can gain the confidence to actually try out because you see this all throughout social media but how do we actually implement it into their minds first of all fashion week <laughs> This is not going to be a very popular answer. <laughs> Sucks. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it, it really makes girls feel horrible. Um, and it's, it, you, you have to have this confidence. And, you know, we, I've had super confident girls do it once and they said, oh my God, I never want to do that again. Um, just because it's a lot of work, it's a lot of no, this industry is a lot of rejection. Um, so if if you if you don't have that confidence and the people the support around you, you you've got to work on your support group. You've got to believe in yourself more and more. Self affirmation. I mean, Iskra's massive on that, and and it works for her and it works for everybody involved. Um, you really need to pull it from within inside yourself. But being a model and doing Fashion Week, ugh. Like, it's really, it's, it's not all it's cracked up to be. This industry is so wonderful, and this is just one small segment of it. So just, if, if you don't feel that that's right for you, look, there's so many other things to do, you know? Yeah, and if it's at school, go with friends. And like Gary said, kind of a similar note, if, think about why you wanna do the show. And if it's not a great, healthy reason, take those friends that you were gonna go to try out with and go to the movies, or go for dinner, or go to something else that would be awesome to do with them um, that will make you feel good. Hi, um, so I'm wondering um, about what, um, like the psychological and emotional repercussions of the way that um, women's apparel is sized in terms of always striving to be less and sort of going, um, I've heard a lot of talk about what does it mean to be a double zero? What does it mean to be zero is nothing? And, and why, um, why do we strive to make ourselves to nothing? Um, and uh, there was some discussion earlier about the, the semiotics of, of, of this industry and of clothing and, and what are the repercussions of allowing these somewhat arbitrary numbers to signify things about our identities and about our self-worth. 
I mean, I think women are just programmed, again, that damn patriarchy, <laughs> to take up less space. Um, and I mean, I'm not an expert on that, but I know from a personal experience um, and the way that we go about our lives, we have to work hard mentally to reclaim that and make those labels mean nothing. Um, yeah. And it just takes time. The value system placed on females, even from the smallest age, is on our appearance. It is when we see the princesses. It is when we go to the store and we see that the girls says, the, the girls top says, I'm cute, and the, the boys top says, I'm adventurous, I'm a hero. We have to change that narrative within our own homes. We have to change it within schools. I know you're, you have so many things going on, but my long-term dream is to have self-care education in school, so mental, physical, emotional health, because we need to learn how we're speaking to ourselves in a loving way and each other. So actually, there's an actionable thing that all of you guys can do right now is change the conversations, A, you're having in the mirror with yourself, and B, with each other. If you have daughters, if you have mothers and, and brothers and sons and anyone, if you hear them saying something that is bringing them down, stop it. Don't be passive. Actually take action and say, w I wouldn't speak to my best friend like that. Mm -hmm. And I love that quote because it's, uh, you know, it's a girl saying, oh, I feel so fat. Look at my rolls. I can't wear this right now. And say, don't speak to my best friend like that. We've got to speak to ourselves in a loving way and change that value system, especially within females, when the first thing that you probably say when you see your friend is, oh, my goodness, have you lost weight? You look great. We have to change that. How are you doing at work? How's that promotion going? Oh my goodness, I love that creativity you had the other week when you did this. Or we have to just make that actionable. Of And I do that with my girlfriends all the time. And we are so empowered and so strong. And hell would we ever let a piece of fabric ever let it break us. If we can't fit into the jeans, so what? We're freaking badasses, you know? It's yeah. <laughs> whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Hi guys, thank you for speaking at the panel. This is actually my alma mater, so I'm really glad to get a chance to come back here and see you guys talk. Thank you so much. Um, me and my sister are actually twins, and from the very beginning, I'm a size 8, she's a size 12 or 14, so we both notice how people treat us differently. She's so curvaceous, she's a tomboy, but she doesn't really show her curves. I love showing off what very little curves I have, and it's just how do you get to a place where you can celebrate your body or celebrate your looks for whatever reason. Like, I'm on a thinner spectrum, but I have broad shoulders, I have chubby cheeks. How do you get to a place where you can appreciate your own body? Like, how can I get my sister to appreciate the curves that she has or appreciate any size you have? Because we do fluctuate in our size. How do we appreciate who we are in the moment? I think it starts again with the reaffirmation. You know, look at yourself and don't, don't go to the negative in the mirror. It's like, go to the one thing that you love about yourself and then float it from there and be like, you know what, this is great too. Like, this is amazing. It's like, you, you, st you have to start focusing on your positives and, and we go to the negative all the time, men and women. And that's, I think that's the one thing you should do first is be like, wow, I have a great lips. Like, these are amazing. Like, the, the other They're things- They're pretty good. <laughs> I chose them for a reason. Um, <laughs> uh, but just start, telling yourself the great things. Stop kicking yourself in the ass because it's, it, you're doing yourself a disservice and the world and the people around you a disservice as well. Yeah, I got there by cleansing all of my social media of people who, um, whether intentionally or not, uh, didn't make me feel good about myself and started... In life in general. In life in general, yeah. Um, started following people. Yeah, I follow them around on the streets. They make me feel really great. I, I, I know where they live. Um, anyways, I started following people on social media that... Um, looked like me or looked different than me and made me feel good. You know, the blogging community is so great for that because that's where we really see a diversity of everything um, from style to body to race, what have you. Um, and it, it, it works because if you think about the reason why we even feel badly in the first place due to the images that fashion puts out is because we're bombarded with them from princesses to ads on the subway to magazines. Um, the only reason we in this country are programmed like that is because you see it everywhere. So if you reclaim the space that you look every day this far from your face for probably too many hours, it, it'll start to manifest. Yeah, 
And it's definitely the perspective you have as well. Um, we've got to make those daily choices. So like you said, when we look in that mirror, how do we choose to view ourselves? And also, what do we want the focus of our day to be? Because if I'm worried about I'm not having a thigh gap, am I stopping myself from going to that meeting and killing it? Am I stopping myself from reading that book? Am I, what are you sacrificing? So having the perspective of actually really what is important is really, really imperative. And day to day, what I think can really help people is a gratitude list. Because when you actually think, this is an able body, I'm out here, I'm in New York City. Like, the sun is shining, maybe not today. There is so many great things, and me and my housemate will do this, and she has little funny things like, I ate my favorite muffin. The subway was on time. And so she's, <laughs> no, it's true, and she's now longer worrying about her cellulite. Yeah. It, like, it, it's, it's really interesting how when you have a mind of gratitude, you can't also have the same time thinking about, um, degenerative thoughts about yourself. So keeping that mind and heart full of gratitude is something that um, I try and do every single day. We're human, we're gonna have those moments. Or as me as a model, maybe I see that other girl who got the campaign and for that split second you find yourself going, well, what's wrong with me or why didn't I? And we just have to take ourselves and give ourselves the tool, which again, I wish it was in the education system. It might not be. We can find it online now on social media find it within yourself or learn it, teach it within your friendship group as well. Thank you. Thank you.